Okay, we're back on a Wednesday with uh, Carlos Suarez. <clears throat> he is not in Mexico City. Uh, in fact, he is not in London. He was in London, and now he's in his old haunt uh, in Austria, in Innsbruck, Austria, with hundreds of friends he has there from 10 years of visiting. <laughs> Hi, Carlos. <laughs> Hello, so good to see you, Jay, and aloha. I can almost say welcome from tomorrow, as it's uh, almost midnight here in Austria, of course, but it's a pleasure to connect with you. Uh, I did just arrive today from spending the last few days in London, but um, uh, look forward to a conversation again, uh, never a dull moment in what's happening in the world, and today we're going to talk a little more about the continuing saga of Brexit and maybe uh, what's unfolding and, and maybe where things will go in the future, because it seems to be a... a a train in motion, but with still uncertainty and, and well, just a lot of uh, turmoil. Yeah, so you were there. I mean, I really, uh, you're, you're in, in good good position to tell us what's happening and what people think in London. Can you, can you give us a handle on how it was, how it is? You know, I mean, of course, we have to understand the context because this, uh, this referendum now, almost three years ago in June 2015, was also very divisive in the sense that you had uh, generational divide, younger populations generally wanted to remain and did not support the, the referendum to exit the Brexit. Uh, it tended to be more popular with older, but also rural and urban divide. The urban areas tended to support remain. They wanted to stay, you know, favor staying in. Uh, and so a city like London is majority remain. They were very much uh, not in favor of Brexit. Uh, Brexit is now seeming to move forward as an inevitable, inexorable process but still devices, still uh, unclear. Uh, but again, just to underscore, so in London, I mean, again, you're, you're not going to have, it, say, the, the, the massive uh, wave for exiting, but there, nevertheless, you still have strong pro-Brexit uh, political leaders. Uh, the parliament that brings together all of the country, of course, has been hashing this out for now the last two years and has not yet been able to reach a withdrawal agreement. Yeah. Uh, and just today, I mean... The, the latest developments today is that you had the EU leaders uh, gathering in Brussels and Theresa May, the Prime Minister there, once again presenting uh, her case. Uh, she has not gotten approval for yet, but basically asking for one more extension. Uh, the original date was, as you recall, 29 March. Well, that's gone. Here we are in April. And right now, the latest uh, uh, is that uh, they are scheduled to leave this Friday, uh, 12 April. But uh, more likely, uh, where you know, as we speak now, they are they are finishing dinner without May. They're discussing at the EU leaders, and they are likely to consider uh, a longer term extension that uh, it can be anywhere from about nine to twelve months. We're told now, and so mm -hmm. it, it may be that the EU leaders will simply request a longer extension. Uh, the Prime Minister Theresa May is actually requesting thirty June. She wants just a few more months, but they're saying, look, why don't we just make it longer? You figure it out. And as soon as you do get an agreement that you can pass, you can actually leave a little sooner. There, there's sort of a, a lot of wheeling and dealing going on. But it remains to be seen. You know, the EU leaders themselves, all 27 of the other member states, must agree to this. Uh, and then you have Theresa May, who has already tried to offer her own head and resign, and she can't seem to leave yet. They need to get agreement for her to leave. But, but by most measures, she is a lame duck. She's going to agree to stay on until whatever agreement they can have uh, and, and basically, at that point, once they deliver an agreement, he would then be replaced by some subsequent, uh, you know, transition. So a lot of uncertainty remains, but, uh, you know, we still see most indications are that there's going to be an exit, whether it's going to be the soft one or the harder line one. Again, anyone's guess at this point, it's still up in the air. Well, you know, one thing that I noted this morning in the Washington Post was an article about how uh, Macron in France, uh, he came up with the notion, and I think this is going to be popular among the commissioners of the EU, uh, that, that Britain, as a condition of any extension, lose its seat uh, as a commissioner on that commission. <clears throat> I guess that's, uh, that's leverage. Um, it's also an appropriate sanction for all this delay. I mean, they've, they've been very patient, I would say, and uh, they're running out of patience. So uh, what, what effect would yeah. that have going forward if Britain is no longer... UK is no longer on the commission. Yeah, and the commission is one of the EU itself is a complex set of institutions. One of the most important, which is sort of an administrative executive one, is the EU commission. And, and each of the member states, all 28 members, have a commissioner. And often they have a particular portfolio, let's say. And usually the important countries have an important one. But essentially what that tells you, uh, if it does go through, and it is certainly a proposal, as you said, President Macron of France has put, 
workforce, it would be a signal that, hey, okay, you're pretty much now out of the top layer decision making. Uh, it, it sort of whittles away at their power. And of course, once the Brexit does happen, we have to understand too that once an agreement is made and they finally, okay, we're going, there's still a transition period uh, that's going to happen in uh, approximately 21 months, although that could also be flexible and could be extended even more. But that period of, of uh, transition is really when they're, then they're going to go on to continue negotiating what is going to be the future agreement, uh, perhaps a different trade arrangement, a different trade deal. A lot depends on what trade, uh, what exit they have, what mm. Brexit, because the, the main issue, there are several, but among them is, the European Union really is what we might call a customs union. It is basically a single market where all the countries are able to make trade easier. They can exchange without tariffs, without customs. But the European Union, once you leave, you're not going to have access to that, most likely, and, and that's what's expected. Uh, the U.K. will be gone, and so what will their relationship be? What kind of agreement? And, again, that's sort of like a next set of discussions. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're just deciding, how can we leave? Do we leave, you know, with a hard, clean break, or do we leave with some sort of maybe partial access. So um, these are the kind of tough uh, detailed questions. But yeah, like you said just now with, with the proposal from Macron, what that suggests is they are growing impatient. They, they basically are ready to cut them loose. And also, they, they don't want to, I mean, on one hand, they want to see it stable and, and maybe not chaotic, but they also want to make sure that it's not without pain, without uh, recognition that, hey, if you are going to go, well, it's going to be, you're going to be in a situation where you will no longer be making the rules, you'll no longer have a seat at the table, and that's happening probably sooner than later. You know, I, I can't help but think that given all the trouble that the EU has, you know, it's, it's having all kinds of economic difficulties, political difficulties, things are swinging to the right, um, this, this whole notion of nationalism is, is popping up in various members of the EU, and you get, you get, you know, you get supremacists in some countries, and the whole thing is becoming very divisive in the EU itself. And I can't help but think that the leaders of the EU really want Britain to stay around. They really, really want it to stay there for the solidarity of the EU group, as against Russia, who would love to see the EU fall apart, economically and geopolitically. But my, my question is, you know, some of the people on that commission, some of the people in the EU, some of the leaders uh, are willing to give the UK way into 2020, you know, or longer to figure this out. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking they would like to be generous this way because they really want the UK to see the disaster involved in Brexit. They really want, um, you know, the UK to change its mind. They don't want Brexit at all. And I think they think that the more time they give Brexit, uh, the more time the UK will see the error of its ways in Brexit. What do you think? Well, I, I think there are some who would agree that, including some politicians in the U.K., uh, and we have to understand that while right now most of the wheels suggest that uh, it's going to happen, uh, there is always a scenario still, theoretically, they could back out. They could have a referendum, for example, at another at a national level, and, you know, people knowing today what they know versus what they knew almost three years ago, could this be a different outcome? It's a very messy proposition because... For some, it would be losing faith, uh, obviously for the, the prime minister and for her, her party, which has some of the more hardline Brexiters, uh, they would not go for it. And, and they are maybe threatening that this would create massive chaos. On the other hand, you know, what, what if it is a, a situation where the people say, you know what, on second thought, and from what we know now, uh, and like you said, from the EU perspective, certainly... Their first preference would be no, don't leave. You know, we can. You know, we are better off working. You know, to address your concerns and challenges. And I think more, more to the point, what you spoke to is really this Brexit is simply one of several crises the EU has been facing uh, in the past years, particularly the last five, six years, maybe the last ten years, especially uh, sovereign debt crisis. What well, we had years ago, the, the so-called Brexit, and also major problems in Italy and, and, and Portugal and, and Ireland, where they could not meet their sort of debt obligations, and they had to effectively get bailed out, especially Greece. But in addition, you saw, what, now three, four years ago, the massive migration crisis. I can remember talking with you from here in Innsbruck, where there was this huge flow in the year 2005 of a million migrants, mostly from Middle East, also Africa, and that was a major challenge for the EU, where to put them, how to deal with it. And now Brexit comes along, and it's one more you know, crisis. So it is a challenge. 
um, you know, it, it, for us to sit back, it's easy to say, look, why don't you just forget about it? Go back to where you were and work it out. But, you know, it's not that easy. They're, they're, you know, the EU, I'm sorry, the UK, we have to understand, was always a skeptical, reluctant partner. They, they joined in the early 70s, what was then the European community. They were not one of the founding members, uh, like the original six, you know, France, Germany, Italy, and the Benelux. Uh, so they came along, and they were always kind of like the reluctant partner. They didn't want to join the euro currency, which they never did. They were reluctant to join even like a joint military defense issues because they have their own powerful military. So for some, it's like they were never really full-fledged members anyway. They never now, adopted the euro that, though, as currency. That's right. No, no, they never did, and they opted out. Uh, it's the same with Denmark and Sweden, but those are small countries that you know aren't big players. Uh, Britain and, of course, the pound sterling used to be the, the currency of the world that the, the international finance revolved around, and for them it was a very symbolic issue, but also symbolically in the sense that they want to control their monetary policy in a way that once you adopt the euro, you no longer do. Basically, the central bank in Frankfurt, Germany, the European Central Bank, then controls your currency. Uh, the U British have always been very, very reluctant to give up that power. Mm -hmm. But again, back to your main point, uh, obviously, there could be a scenario where they chose to stay out. Right now, the most betting is that that's not in the cards. But I can tell you, there are there is sentiment that gosh, why don't they just figure it out and realize the costs are so high, the uncertainty. Uh, but I, I, you know, there are definitely those who are very firmly in favor of the exit who would say, "Hogwash, we have to do it. It's, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll get over this. We've had crisis before. Give us a few years, and we'll work it all out." Uh, I also but, can't uh, help but think, Carlos, that. This is an example of nationalism. It's an example of divisiveness, not only among the parliament, but among the people. You know, it's similar to what we have in the U.S. Yeah. And uh, I can't help mm -hmm. but think of Russia, you know, who is not only active in the U.S. to try to change public opinion and change voting and change the views of legislators and affect government, affect democracy. It's also busy, busy in Europe, in many places in Europe, yeah. including the U.K., so what you have is um, a, a divisiveness, one way or the other. I'd also like to add that a few, a few weeks ago, a, a friend of mine sent a video of, of a fellow that um, was um, giving a speech at Oxford. Uh, he was not an Oxford student or faculty at all. <clears throat> he was a, a townie, if you will, from a local town around Oxford. Um, and uh, he, he spoke in a Cockney dialect. Um, you could tell he was not, you know, of, of the upper class in Britain. Um, but he was, uh, he was doing two things. One is he was saying, we have a problem here. He repeated that many times. He's apparently very popular among a number of people in Britain. <clears throat> and the problem was uh, around the Muslims, uh, around the migrants, but also the Muslims who are, you know, full citizens. Um, and uh, he had, the second part is he had, movie clips of demonstrations uh, by the Muslims and against the Muslims uh, in that part of the UK, in, I guess, that area around Oxford. Um, and he was saying that, and he was showing these clips, and they were very nearly violent. People were yelling at each other. Uh, you know, you wouldn't see this in the U.S., or at least you wouldn't see it now these days, it seems like. We may see it later, but not now. And there was a, there was a real tension about the relationship of the, the Muslim groups, parades, demonstrations, what have you, and, and, the, and the, the, you know, the, uh, the, old, the older folks in, the, in, the, in those towns. So what I'm saying is I think they, have a, they do have a problem. I think he's right. Uh, they have a social problem. Uh, and I think, I think it must be one of the factors that lead people to vote for Brexit. They want to close down migration, immigration, don't you think? Yeah. Well, of course, and I mean, there are a lot of things packed in there. And, and first, just to be very clear, even the Brexit referendum uh, was one in which we know there was direct influence from Russians trying to troll and carry out a sort of a polarization. Not a lot different from what they did in the U.S. election and what they've done in many others. Uh, let's also remind our viewers, though, that you know, the United States has its own history of intervention in other elections as well, although, of course, we do it for the right reasons, but there's been a lot of manipulation and, and, and the history of the U.S., uh, its own share of election, uh, I guess, uh, influencing. But that aside, the reality is that I think this Brexit fits into a larger pattern of, of uh, 
of trends that we've seen, and, and we, we often hear the term globalization, what we know to be the movement of people, of goods, of, you know, of, of uh, the flow, right, of ideas uh, and money. But there's another notion, globalism, which is maybe a, a different way of explaining it. It's more the belief, the idea that the interdependence that's created by globalization is a good thing. It's more of an ideology, maybe even an ideology of the elite, because the reality is that globalization obviously has winners and losers. You know, as a, as a whole, the economy wins. We have, you know, trade expands uh, wealth. But the reality, too, is that there are losers. There are many who are left out or who are disconnected. And I think not only in Brexit, but in the U.S., uh, the election of Trump, but in many other places, you see a disconnect between the elite and the masses who are, you know, obviously feeling frustrated and angry. Uh, then you have the use of social media and the use of populist, you know, national leaders who will stir up a lot of emotions. And, you know, today it's quite sad to see in the U.K. a place that has had generations of immigrants. Now, mind you, the numbers have grown for them, too, in recent years. Uh, and then you've got added to that terrorism that you know, is very real. It's not abstract. They've had terror bombings. No, sure. But my point here is that you, you have got immigrants who've been there for generations, uh, integrated, fully assimilated, British, British citizens. Suddenly, they, they are living in a world that's very different than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, where you, you, you can feel this fear and distrust. And um, so you have this anger, this sense of frustration that's now being, uh, you know, used everywhere, and leaders are tapping it, and uh, and so it's gotten uglier. The dialogue, the polarization of, of you know, of everything, the, the civil, uh, you know, civic order, if you will, uh, it, it it has helped us explain and understand what's happening in Brexit. What, how do we make sense of you know the Trump phenomenon and the rise of a lot of these anti-immigrant uh, groups in in. Poland and Hungary and elsewhere in Italy, they've got a new right wing government. So it is this notion of globalism, which again, it's the losers and the winners that are suddenly duking it out. And, and uh, you know, uh, the reality is that again, back to Brexit, it's a generational divide. It's also an urban-rural divide. It's also an education. Those who supported Brexit, uh, or maybe to put it differently, those with less education, with only a high school or less, were more likely to support Brexit. Those who had, you know, more university education, more particularly graduate and so on, are obviously going to think differently and see globalization as something to, to harness and to win from. But we have to appreciate there are winners and losers. Uh, the winners are broad and diffuse. The losers are usually very specific and targeted and narrow, and they often don't have the recourse to, you know, fight back or, or to, you can't just retrain and suddenly be a, you know, a rocket scientist. Uh, if you've lost your job at the factory, unless they're going to literally come in and give you another job, you are out of job, and that you know that that, that presents a real immediate challenge. So no, this all, of globalism. It's all it's all a yeah. surprise in the sense that we thought that um, the UK, um, aside from problems they've had with Northern Ireland over the years, you know, was a was a sedate place. Everybody you know was very respectful of each other. And they could do good government. They could agree on things, um, and they were you know sort of an efficient democracy. I maybe. Maybe I'm myop myopic about that, but that's my impression over the years. Now we don't see that. Uh, we, we see a, a real similarity between, you know, the ineffectiveness of, of their government right now, it's quite ineffective, locked up, and the ineffectiveness of yeah. Congress, really locked up, can't do anything. Um, and it's really yeah. a slide that, that's, uh, that's parallel. The, the other thing that, uh, that, that strikes me is that people in this country are losing confidence or have lost confidence in the government. Well, certainly that must be happening in UK too. They, they see their yeah, parliament yeah. ineffective, can't reach a decision, can't solve this huge important problem. They must be, all of them must be losing confidence in it, no? Yeah. Absolutely, no, there, there's a total rejection of the political establishment. And that's another aspect of this, uh, both the rise of this globalism idea, it's a rejection of those who somehow are out of touch. Uh, and it's reflected in the fact that they can't, figure out how to solve this. I mean, more than two years now negotiating president, and they haven't figured it out. Um, and so most, many people, even those maybe educated and supportive of the Remain side, whatever, they're just frustrated that the leaders can't seem to figure it out. Yeah. Um, and again, there, there, there's many angles to it. I mean, some of it is that the, the, the dialogue, the narrative has, has just gotten more pronounced and ugly. Some of it is that we live in this age of the 24-7 news cycle and, and the use of social media that people want to live by sound bites. They want to make complicated things sound easy, 
and, and sort of push these very, uh, you know, black or white uh, uh, scenarios where if you're in or you're out, well, wait, there's some, isn't there something in between? Uh, and, and, and again, just look at the instantaneous news that we get that uh, you can see how quickly political leaders can be ridiculed or, or obviously embarrassed by some statement or just taken out of context. It's a tough time to be a political leader, and these issues of especially involving trade uh, and economics, I mean, um, the results are, are not, uh, or, or let's see, changes in them don't have results that are immediate. It takes time, uh, and, and, and yet the losers are more immediate, and they're yeah. very narrow, and, and, um, and so it's very difficult to, uh, to find an easy answer out. Well, you know, there was, a, uh, uh, there was a piece this morning, Carlos, on uh, National Public Radio, um, about, uh, about hate speech on social media. Um, I found it very interesting, and, uh, and, I, and I've seen, I've seen uh, this on the internet, too, in, in pod, podcasts, uh, where these guys uh, study exactly how social media works, um, and about how, uh, you know, the, short of real limitations on what you can say, and, and how these communities are developed on, on social media, uh, we have in, in the U.S. and probably in Europe, too, um, social media communities that are clearly um, designed for and populated by hate speech. Uh, and I think that's got to be part of it there, just as it is part of it here. Carlos, we're going to take, uh, take a one-minute break. When we come back, I'd like to, you know, you and me put our heads together, be completely rational, uh, see this from the 50,000-foot level, and solve the problem together right now, right here today on ThinkTech. Okay? We'll be right back. <laughs> hey, aloha. Stan Energy Man here on ThinkTech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. So we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. Global Connections, and we're talking with Carlos Juarez in Innsbruck, Austria. We love to talk to him everywhere he travels. <laughs> and we're talking today about Brexit, a very interesting discussion, especially now when it's front page all around the world. So, Carlos, uh, we were going to come back and, and solve the problem. We have a few minutes. Um, so <laughs> let, let's extract all the heat and all the hate, and let's see if we can figure out what exactly is in front of Parliament. Um, economic issues, uh, customs, trade issues, what kind of issues are there and how should they be resolved? Well, on one hand, at its core, it's really what relationship will the UK have with the EU if it separates, assuming it does. In other words, will it be a complete total break where they have to then negotiate separately with individual, you know, places like the UK with the US? Or will there be, and there are several models, there's a Norway model, uh, which is one that's been given, where Norway is not a member of the EU, however, they have access to the market, they pay, they pay to get access to that, but in return, it gives them reduced uh, you know, tariffs and, and, and more ability to sell and buy. Uh, so, kind of like you have some of the benefits, but not all. Now, that's not a good option for those who seek the hard Brexit, the hard liners, if you will. Uh, but uh, the fact is, uh, we're seeing now more and more, given this chaos of the last couple of years, that uh, a, a, a harder Brexit, maybe, or, or one in which they don't really have a defined relationship, 
is costly, and, and, and it already has cost them. Uh, you've got, uh, for example, Japanese car firms like Nissan that went to the U.K. to set up a plant because part of the single market means they can then sell the car in Spain and Portugal and mm -hmm. Poland with no tariff. Suddenly now they would have to pay 10% of the value of the car, and that could go up. Well, even in the last uh, month, uh, Nissan has decided not to continue any investment in the U.K. So examples like that are going to be abounding where, you know, why would you set up in the U.K. if you don't have access to the market? So part of it is that. There's a lot of other complex issues, including, for example, the rights of movement and of workers. Uh, as we speak today, actually, they have a process where, uh, just reading, in fact, today that, uh, let me confirm it here, something like 400,000 European nationals, that is, people not from the U.K., but from other parts of Europe who reside in the U.K. and work and live, have now applied. Uh, there's a process that will allow them to stay indefinitely. So you can continue working, continue staying, sort of like, almost like an amnesty of sorts. I mean, they don't call it that, but it just means, look, if you register and you apply, mm -hmm. you could keep your job, keep your residency. In mm -hmm. other words, you're not going to be kicked out. Mm -hmm. uh, 400,000. Similarly, there are hundreds of thousands of U.K. residents in Spain and you know, Holland uh, and, and France who will do the same. Uh, and so there's what's going to happen with that. Now, what's not clear, what still needs to be negotiated is the rights of work. Will there still be this capacity because the U.K. depends heavily on a lot of, uh, you know, brain power and hard work, you know, Polish plumbers and other, you know, construction workers from Romania, whatever it might be, but also brain surgeons and, and, and academics. And if they don't have the ability to work, uh, that becomes a challenge. Um, so there's no kind of technicality. The other, we've spoken about this in another of our shows, was the, 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 the border issue with the Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. That is one of the more sensitive issues because... If they don't have access to the single market, the customs union, they will have to probably set up some border checks for any goods that go between that border. And there are many concerns that that's going to bring back the days of the, the troubles, the violence of, of Northern Ireland, because it's now been 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement. Things have settled into a nice, comfortable existence, but could that be disrupted? So there's that element, too. Again, uh, we have yet to see if it's going to be the hard or the softer. And uh, I, I well, you I know what I hear you, you saying when I what I hear you saying is uh, if I made you king, they don't have a lot of kings in Europe anymore. But if I made you king, you what you would do is um, you would you would have a Brexit, but after the Brexit, it would look like look a lot like there hadn't been one. <laughs> you would try to emulate yeah. what was going on before. You know, to maintain the relationships, maintain the benefits on both sides. Um, and the people who, you know, are so interested in having a Brexit now, they somehow would be satisfied, like Trump's base, you know. They would somehow be satisfied. But in fact, it wouldn't be a Brexit. It would be an, an emulated, you know, let's go back to the way it was. A little bit of that. And, you know, what I feel sorry is the younger generation, those that are today, let's say, 25, 30, 35, they are the future of, let's say, the U.K. Uh, and the decisions are being made by these old-timers that are angry and frustrated and they're out of jobs and they're in these rural areas. I think it's a bit unfair because they're not going to be around in 20, 30, 40 years, yeah. whereas the young generation who they have only grown up in a world of knowing themselves as Europeans and having this, you know, mobility and flexibility – and they're almost being penalized, partly because they don't show up to vote. That's always a problem with, you know, young populations. But um, here, I go back to my own. I have to confess, I am a globalist. Uh, that's why I'm here at the moment. And, and, and I just think it's one of these things that it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. You know, we live in an interdependent world. And yes, okay, you're angry, you lost your job, or this or that. But to be honest, uh, we live in a world where transnational, transglobal issues are just the reality. And, and you can't somehow create these barriers and walls very easily without a cost. One last cost question, Carlos, high. one last question, and we only have a minute left at this point, um, is this. Um, you know, um, so you're, you're an academic in Mexico, um, and of course the United States is watching this closely. But my question to you is, why should we care what happens in Brexit? So let, let them do whatever kind of Michigas they want to do. Um, does it matter to us? Why do we care? 
Well, it, it, it may matter to some more than others. Uh, and I think it matters because what happens there, if it falls apart in the worst-case scenario and maybe Europe continues in a spiral downward, uh, it does have an impact on uh, our relationship with the Atlantic Alliance. Now, you can already say that some of that has been damaged by maybe the, the Trump policies themselves. But I guess another way to put it is simply say that just as Europe has an interest in the U.K. not melting down and vice versa, the U.K. needs a strong EU to help it survive, I think similarly the United States and us as citizens of the world, if you will, need uh, the world to figure out how to solve its problems and issues. And, you know, that's not an easy task, but um, if, if it goes badly, I think it can affect us all in, in yeah. different ways that we might not, may not realize. Yeah, absolutely. We, we're all in this together. We are a global, a global world, and we have to care for each other. We have to be concerned about every nation. Every nation must care about all nations. Thank you so much, Carlos. Yes. It's great to talk with you. I'll see you in two weeks. Thank we'll you. do more wherever you may be. Aloha. Aloha.